All right. Good afternoon and welcome to our second session at the Expo stage. We are having Jacob Sklenner go over the eight types, eight steps of killing a mature buck. I'm just as nervous as you are about this. Jacob is one of the hosts of the Mobile Hunter podcast. He is having his own series come out the last Wednesday of August. So if you enjoy this content, please do not hesitate to download uh, the podcast and give it a listen. It's Wild Calling Wednesdays. And without further ado, I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to let Jacob talk. Please welcome Jacob Sklenner to the Mobile Hunter podcast stage. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate you attending. Um, like Rick just introduced, uh, my presentation is going to be on the eight steps to killing a mature buck. Uh, it's kind of a bold title, but the, the way I think of it more is the eight pieces of the puzzle, the eight pieces of critical information that I seek to find out whenever I'm targeting a specific buck. And this works as well for other deer as well. Um, if you're not targeting a specific deer, if you're targeting a certain age class, size class, the way that I develop this process is more to fit the needs of I need to get an order for the things that I need to work on. I need to be, improve as a hunter while I'm going through my process, not only just to kill deer, but to become better and more efficient at killing deer. Um, these steps I've ranked kind of in, in levels of importance for myself, with the most important starting at one, going down to eight. But all of them are pieces of information that are going to help you execute. And in my opinion, if you have these eight pieces of information, you will absolutely get a chance at a deer. And I think when you see how much this covers, you'll come away from this presentation agreeing with the same thing. So why did I develop this process? Um, I, uh, I was coached by a really, really fantastic coach in wrestling, uh, Ben Askren. He's an Olympian. He's a multiple-time world champion in MMA. He's a jiu-jitsu world champion. And he invented an entire style of wrestling. It's called the Funky Style. His nickname was Ben Funky Askren. And the reason that it was called Funk is because it was scrambling. It was the moves and the technique between the moves. You'd go to hit the first move, your opponent would react in a certain way, and then you would progress to the second move. Well, all of his style happened between moves, and it looked really odd. He would scramble around, put himself in potentially dangerous situations, and he had just this amazing understanding of positional awareness and how your opponent's reacting to you, and it allowed him to adapt in the middle of a situation, in the middle of a scramble, in the middle of a progression, and then succeed. And it would be like, Everyone would come away from these matches thinking he put himself in danger so many times, there's no way he could have won, and he'd always come out in the scoring position. And I was really curious when I first went to Askin Wrestling Academy to see how was he even going to coach this. It just looked like gobbledygook nonsense. It looked so high level, I couldn't possibly fathom how to do it. And really what he did is he would take the first move you're going for, he would teach you how to absolutely master that offense, and then he would teach you the defense to it, how to master that defense. And then he would work even further into the second move in the progression and then how to defend it. And he would go further and further until you gained a full understanding for this process. And it was all based on first you apply pressure to his shoulders, he pushes back, and that opens up his legs. It would be I give this, he gives that, this is how I respond. And so it made these crazy abstract principles really tangible and understanding. And I developed a real love for processes and developing them for myself and using them in my life through that. I moved on to college. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I really, really struggled in Calc 2. Calc 2, where I went to school, uw Platteville, they throw you into it super early. They throw you into it with a high course load, and it's what they call a weed-out course. So for my course, the average score on the first exam was like 53%, and over half the class didn't pass. And so I could not accept that I wasn't going to pass a class. I'd never done that in my life, and I wasn't about to start now. So I resorted to teacher's office hours, and when that didn't work out, I went to textbooks. And I developed that if I just took this approach I learned in wrestling and I applied it to school, I could develop the eight steps to solving this problem. And if I went through them and I did every single one of the eight steps correct, I was going to end up with the right answer. And if I did any of those steps wrong, instead of relearning the entire process, I could just focus on the one area that I had wrong. And it made me learn how to learn. It made me develop that, that uh, discipline much, much better. Um, I applied this wrestling approach to school, of course. I applied the school approach now to hunting, and it really, really helped me out in hunting. And through all this application and trial and error, I found that there's eight pieces of criteria that are incredibly beneficial to me, and that when I find them out and I follow this process, I not only become really efficient at killing deer, but I become very good at improving and finding the areas that I lack 
whether it be timing or where he's bedded or things like that. So how is this process useful? Uh, basically, it simplifies your tasks. We all have been sitting in a public land parking lot looking at the entire property, thinking, how the heck am I going to break this down? Like, Where am I going to scout? You slave over maps for forever, and you go in there, and it doesn't pan out, and it's just a lot to take in at once. Um, the way it's really useful to me is I can work on one specific task, have one mission for the day or one mission for that trip, and I either pass or fail that task for the day, and I can move on to the next one and then realize that, like, hey, I'm inconsistent here. I'm going to get better here. It's made it really, really useful for me. It's kind of like a shot progression where you think about drawing back, settling into your anchor point, settling that pin, being comfortable with it waving around, squeezing that shot instead of forcing a pull, uh, kind of like Andy talked about today with target panic. Um, going through a routine can help you hone in on your process and become very good at it. It's a really broad application. It works in every terrain type I've tried it in. It's worked in the sand hills in Nebraska, steep, rugged hill country in southwestern Wisconsin, as well as Ohio. It's worked in the marshes of Wisconsin. It's worked in very pressured areas, worked in areas with very little pressure. And it's most, it's, it's just extremely applicable because you're finding out the information and you're confirming it about the specific deer or the quarry that you're targeting. Um, it allows you to actually have real feel for how confident you should be in your setups and it allows you to understand what you need to improve at if you just kind of lack that confidence when you're going out in the woods. So these are the steps and pieces of the puzzle. Um, these are the eight criteria that I like to operate on and the eight things that I really, really want to find out about a specific deer or the situation that I'm hunting in. And the first step is where is he bedded? Uh, this is the most important thing to me and I'll touch on a lot of these things very detailed in the coming slides, but number one is where is he bedded? Uh, number two is what size class buck is there, which specific buck is there, or what class of buck is using this area. I want to look at when he's bedded. Uh, that's a huge difficult part of this process is when is this buck using this bed. Uh, number four is how is, the, how is he entering or exiting the bed? What is that deer's access into it in the morning? What's his leaving at night? How does he use the area? Uh, number five is where do I need to set up to kill him? So I found out how he goes in. I need to figure out where I need to be. How do I access that setup is number six. Uh, both trying to keep my pressure out of there as well as get in on that deer as close as possible. Number seven is how does the pressure from other hunters and my own pressure influence this deer? We'll get into that even further later. And then number eight is how might this buck shift? And that can happen. Everyone here is food sources and stuff like that. But I've seen bucks shift due to scouting pressure in the spring. I've seen them shift in the summer due to glassing. I've seen them shift during the season, of course, to other hunters. So it's very important for me to understand those aspects of hunting. So the first step here, where is he bedded? Uh, this is the most important step. In my mind, uh, it's really important for me to figure out where a buck is in a pressured area, specifically in pressured areas, because they're not going to stray very far away from the bed. Uh, my first five hunts last year, I was within three times, I was within 80 yards of the buck I was targeting, and that buck did not cover 80 yards in daylight. He stood up an hour before daylight was over, and he did not cover 80 yards to get to me where I could shoot him. And I had to watch that buck, his rack and fading light, go away. Um, but you can be as close as possible and in the right situation to have it still not work out. So to me, it's really important to push the envelope, get really close, and you learn the most about a buck's personality by understanding where he chooses to sit all day, where he believes he's comfortable. You learn a lot about how that deer is going to behave and travel, and you can apply it to a lot of other situations. Um, there's, a, there's a big debate between hunting a bedding area versus a specific bed. To break it down really simply, I hunt more bedding areas when a deer is really shifty or when I'm going after a certain size class of deer, and I prefer honing in on a specific bed if I'm after a specific buck. Um, if I'm in multiple tar going after multiple, multiple targets in a certain area that frequent the area during a time of year, I'll definitely hunt the area more than I'll hunt one specific bed. Uh, you also look at how often does the buck use the area or bed. Um, is this an area that the buck frequently beds and he's there for an entire week or is he on a one day stint or is he with does that's a really important thing to identify when you're in these areas and um, that will kind of shape am i targeting the specific bed or am i targeting the way that this buck is moving around the property bedding um, do other deer use the area when the buck is not bedding in it it's really important for you to understand you'll see later in this example of my wisconsin buck this year um, are there other deer like does that use this bed all year long before he moves in? So in the case of the buck I killed in Wisconsin, it was actually a doe bed that was marked with a rub because the buck was using that bed when the doe came into heat. And they would essentially bed on the same root ball together. It's very important for you to understand, are other deer using this area? I may see blown up sign here and think it's great for rut, 
but what are they do using this area and where are they gonna move to? How am I gonna bump them when I access my setup? Um, another thing to consider is how am I gonna find these beds? So for me, a lot of it starts with e-scouting and I already have a lot of breakdowns on hill country e-scouting. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this really short when I show you live, but I actually break down a marsh that's 32 miles east of here. It's a private marsh, so I try not to pick anywhere that was public. Sorry if you have permission on this marsh, but it lines up very similar to not only the areas I hunt back home, but the areas that I killed my buck in. Um, if you were looking for more hill country stuff, I have three links. I'll make this presentation public, but I have three different podcasts slash video instructionals that I've done on my channel and both with Josh Talker on his channel before the echo, uh, breaking down hill country examples. But I'm going to switch over really quick to the e-scouting and you guys are going to get a look at my Onyx, which everyone I'm sure loves. Um, I'm going to pull up some notes really quick. So when I'm e-scouting, the first thing I look for is access points. I look for where are other people going to be coming from? And I mark all these points in this blue color. So I'm going to slowly reveal these to you. And this red outline is just kind of like what a border would look like of a property. That's fairly typical for what I've seen in Michigan and also Wisconsin. So for me, it's really important to identify these areas of access. So I'm going to mark different roads. I'm going to mark where I expect the pressure to be coming from. And I always mark that in aqua color. So if you look here, you can see really clearly. I'll switch over to Spartan Forge really quick. You can see really clearly now when I'm looking at UAV imagery with leaf off that I can see that there's a human trail here. I'm immediately identifying that as a source of danger. I'm immediately identifying that as either an area I can use to be away from the bucks that they understand people are going to use this trail. They're not going to be as disturbed by my access in that area. But I'm also going to keep aware that's probably where a lot of people are going to come from. So we go back to this example here, looking at this property here. One second. Looking at this property. I can see that a lot of people are probably going to access from this border where the marsh hits the road. A lot of people are probably going to access from this lot up here, and they're going to come down this trail here. And I can see that there's a boat ramp here, and I assume that that's probably going to be one of the less utilized accesses. Right here is kind of a lake that you can see a little bit clearer in Spartan Forge here. But that's the first thing for me is where is the pressure? Because I immediately, I don't want to rule out those areas, but I want to be aware of how that buck is going to be influenced. The next thing I look at, just to be very, very quick about this, is I look at buck bedding. So I mark in pink potential areas where I think bucks are bedded. So I'm going to reveal all my buck bed waypoints here. And for me, a lot of this is occurring on isolated cover. A lot of the buck bedding that I really like to go after white being these high confidence waypoints, I really like to go after bucks that aren't just betting on the edge of a big oak island, because as you guys probably have seen in Michigan, that's an extremely common place for people to target and hunt. It's been made very, very popular. Um, yes, they will bet on it, but I really see a lot more happening on little areas that are isolated like this, little pieces that are off of it that allow access to information like that oak island where other deer are roaming, where they can go hit a scrape, understand what does are coming in and out of heat and stuff like that, get their food nearby, but also keep a monitor on those things. And these are going to be very, very hard for people to hunt. So that's another reason I really like to target it. And if you look at these beds here, and then I flip over to Spartan Forge here, you can actually see that each of these places that these beds were marked have a web of trails. And we talk about that spokes on the wheel. A lot of the times when you're targeting a mature buck in a very pressured scenario, he has a lot of different exit strategies, a lot of ways that he can go about leaving that bed, which makes him so hard to target and makes it such a necessary piece of the puzzle, which is why I'm specifically understanding that these beds that have multiple exit strategies, they're isolated, tiny patches of cover that are difficult to target, are much more likely to be a mature buck than an area where he's got one area that he can exit off of a point where he's immediately on the food source. The next thing that I look at after buck bedding and access is I look at doe bedding. Um, I find it really valuable to understand where the does are in proximity to the buck bedding because it allows me to understand how and when these bucks are going to be using their beds. So these pink waypoints that are camp waypoints, I use those to mark doe bedding. So if you look at areas like this, often does will bed on the food source, on the fringes of the food source, and they're pretty habitual with it. So now when I'm looking at all this doe bedding here, I'm looking at areas that I think does might be, and again, you can identify this spring scouting and come back to the map, 
I'm starting to understand, all right, when is this buck going to be using this bed? If the predominant wind here, let's just make up an example. If the predominant wind here is a west wind, then I'm probably going to be targeting buck bedding that's downwind of doe bedding. It makes more sense. The buck can sit in his bed, not only survive in an isolated scenario, but also gather information about the does he's going to chase as he moves on in the afternoon. It's also probably where he's coming from the night before. So moving on from there, the next thing I identify is food. So I use these apple markers to identify food. And these are pretty obvious in marshes. It's just going to be a lot of these fields. I'm going to move to the areas here. So a lot of these fields are going to be glaringly obvious, far travel scenarios, but also very often oak islands. And that will help me get a better feel for travel direction. So not only establish where's the pressure coming from, how are people accessing this, where's the buck bedding, where's the doe bedding in relation to that, but where are they all traveling now in the afternoon, where are the buck's going to be following the does if I'm in a rut hunt scenario, or where are the buck's going to be going after they bed in that isolated cover. So it helps you get a better feel for how the deer are really using the area. After that, I look at deer trails, and this is where this map is going to start to get a little bit crazy. So I use leaf off imagery as much as possible. Wisconsin DNR provides excellent resources for this, but Spartan Forage in a lot of areas does a very good job of this as well. Leaf off imagery works well in Onyx too if you have it in the area. But as you can see, these are all areas that I've identified in Spartan Forage as well. So I'm going to go here and when you look at this, now this is not really cattails. Cattails is kind of what I prefer to hunt. This looks like shorter marsh grass to me with a little bit of cattails mixed in, but I like hunting cover that's over their heads. So oftentimes it makes these trails pretty obvious. Now, if you look here in Onyx, there's not a lot of detail in this scenario. Sometimes it's a little bit better, especially in cattails where it's taller cover. But if you go over to Spartan Forge, it's about as obvious as it gets where all these trails are. And for me, that helps me relate a nighttime trail camera picture or other Pictures, info, info I'm getting, intel, movement, sightings, helps me relate their direction of travel to where they're going. And if I understand where they're going and why they're going there, I start to understand their intent, and I get an actual feel for the specific deer I'm chasing, rather than just saying, oh, he was headed in that direction, don't know where he ended up. Really helps me to be able to find these trails. It also helps me navigate the marshes, too, when you're coming out in the dark and stuff like that. Um, the next thing I do is I look for areas that I need to check for sign. So that's going to be my rub and scrape markers in here. And these are areas that I typically see in marshes are very, very often where a deer would lay sign. So I'm going to reveal all these here. Ooh, sorry. So these rub and scrape markers are where I'm going to be going in order to qualify what is using the bedding down the trail. So now I've got my proposed beds and I've got all the areas that they may travel to, but this is a lot of marsh to cover in a wide, wide, wide circle in a wide, wide, wide loop if I want to touch every single bed and understand what's in each of those beds. So what I'm going to do is if I want to figure out what's bedded here and I don't have a lot of area to cover and I know I have 10 more beds that I want to go see, I'm going to prioritize the bed that has monster sign where the trails end. So the trails end in the food source, the trails end where there's often nighttime sign I'm looking at that nighttime sign to figure out what class of buck is using that bedding. And if there's not really much sign, I don't let that discourage me too much if I have the time because there's plenty of bucks that I've killed that barely leave any sign and they're still giants. And I believe that's because they've been kingpin for a while around there. It's, they don't really need to push other deer out of their area. Their scent, their habitual bedding is enough. But as you can see here, these are the areas that I'm going to go check if I'm not sure. I want to find a big track. I want to find a big rub. I want to do stuff like that. After that, um, I look at monotonous areas. They're pretty obvious on this map. You can tell that this is really monotonous terrain. The stuff other guys aren't going to break down from e-scouting. They're not going to know right away. Um, the next thing I'll look at is how I'm going to access it. So that's a bit of this boat ramp point. I look at ways that I can access off the wall. I really like being able to move down here and access this property from this direction. Not really doing a lot of breakdown on this right now because I just want to keep this quick. Um, and after that, I look at overlooked areas. So let's see if I can get this to show up again here. So I use these points of interest to mark overlooked areas. And for me, I didn't mark all of them. But for me, these are kind of hard to see in on X for people at times. But these are little points jutting out in the marshes, points that are far from access, points within that monotonous terrain. That if you go and look at this in Spartan Forge, you can actually see that there is a huge gap 
in these tamaracks here. There's a huge area that these deer might be. And for me, that looks like it would be excellent rut travel because they're already within a wall of monotonous terrain. I think it would be a really, really great area to go check out. Um, there's these different points here. So I'm starting to look at all the transition from food over here from that Oak Island and it looks like it's funneled down really well. I want to go check out those areas. I really want to go figure out what's going on there. And then points like this one right here, a lot of travel rounding around it. Maybe a place that I set a camera, maybe a place that I set, plan a hunt, but I won't know until I go check it out. And that's why they're interesting to me. And the last thing I'll look out is my scout route. So I'll kind of plan where I want to go on this trip. I'll plan what I want to do and I want to make sure I'm hitting as much areas as possible. So this black line right here is going to be how I would scout this area. So I'll come in from the common access. I want to see how people are pressuring the area. I want to get a feel for what the other hunters are doing in the spring. And so I'll move in here. I'll look at sign, and I'll immediately cruise to these points of interest. I'll look at areas that a lot of trails are touching where I expect to see sign, and I'll get a feel, get kind of a big loop survey of these bedding areas, touching every bedding area I can, but more so focusing on finding the sign leading to and from that bedding area so I know whether I need to do a deep dive at a later time or if I should go right away to that bed because I found something that's absolutely impossible to ignore. So I do like a, a miniature quiz from the audience here. Now I didn't cover some of these areas of the maps, but is there an area on here right now that you guys think might be difficult to access, checks a lot of those boxes and might have some buck bedding? If anyone just want to shout out, feel free. I mean, there's a, to me, there's a pretty obvious area here that people might not be getting to. Go ahead. Yeah, right down here. For me, it's the furthest from all of the other accesses. It's really, really hard for people to get to it unless they're using a kayak, and they got to immediately pitch onto a marsh. What I really like about this area is how often does danger come at those deer from that spot? Probably almost never. It's If you can get through that marsh on a windy day, you're going to be right in the mix with those deer. And they really probably are betting in really specific areas down here, really specific spots, it'd be easy for you to slip around that. That's a, a really awesome point that I purposefully left alone so that we can maybe get a feel for that. So back to the presentation here. Touching on very quick. So what I go through in this process is uh, in spring scouting, what I really like to do is first do that quick lap. I like to make a lap around, check as many bedding areas as possible. I call it mass acquisition of data. And you try to get as many areas as you can. So if you burn them out, that's OK. Um, I use this sign to determine, again, what are those important areas that I need to check out? Where are the ones that have the sign that are leading from those beds? What are the beds that I absolutely need to see? And sometimes, if there's giant sign right outside of that bed, I don't have to go look at it. I already know there's a big deer using it. So it helps me move quicker. Um, I'll do a second lap only if I've confirmed there's a really big target in the area that I want to hone in on. And then I purposely go back in and perfect all those things. Uh, I record where the deer were during the spring. Um, during the spring, I see all the fall sign. I see where they're currently using the marsh. I see all of the different things. And I mark what time of year those, that sign is being used. And that will come into play later, later. But it helps me understand what the deer are doing right now. And later on in summer scouting, I actually get to see how they were affected by all the pressure from the spring scouters. So I'll get back to that in summer scouting here. But the benefit for me of summer scouting is getting to observe where other people prep their trees, where other people set up their trail cameras. You know, some people leave out permanents. I get to now scout the opposition. I get to now figure out what the elite hunter that always goes out in the spring and works really hard, what did they think seeing the exact same sign as I did, looking at the exact same data I did, and how did they choose to set up? And oftentimes, my setups are going to be adjusting to that pressure. And I also get to see not only where the deer were in the summer at that time, but I get to see how they were affected by that spring scouting push. They've shifted now after that spring scouting. They've made a little shift. They may be in the same core areas that they were in the fall, and I observed a lot of that fresh sign. But when a whole bunch of people go in there in the spring and they start scouting it, I go observe in the summer and see, hey, these deer shifted. Instead of this isolated patch of cover, they moved two over in a similar situation. Well, now, whenever that person is going to be hunting over that trail camera that they set up, I'm going to be targeting the deer on that shift over. So you get a feel for actually how they're going to a shift during the season by scouting in the summer, especially when you're in an area like Michigan or Wisconsin, southeastern Wisconsin that has a lot of scouting pressure, 
a lot of really, really like-minded hunters out there. I like to compare their setups to mine, get a feel for the mentality of the hunters out there. Um, I like to make sure that I'm not adjusting their pressure entirely and moving away from my original thoughts, but I also want to know if I need to beat them to the punch on a deer. I need, them, I need to know if this deer is going to move on a private land if he gets bumped, and I need to know if I need to be the first person on it. So I kind of gauge that based on their setups. Um, a lot of the times what I'm doing in the summer is I much prefer setting up my cameras in the summer. I know what foliage is going to be in the way. We're already at max foliage at that point. So I don't have to worry about a lot of interference. And I'm using it as specific resource to capture the pieces of the puzzle that I'm missing. I'm trying to find out one specific piece of information and I'm using them as an asset. Um, in skis and scouting, you'll see the benefit of this later, but it's more scouting my way in, tracking down the buck that I'm after. So piece number two is which buck and what class of buck beds there. So there's many, many ways I can do that. I can look at the size of the bed. I can look at the local sign. I can look at rubs. Basically, if you're looking at the bed and you know it's giant, and a lot of people might not be super experienced with this, and if you're not sure what a big buck bed looks like in your area, bring a tape measure out. Don't be that guy that's like, oh, yay big, that long. Actually bring a tape, quantify it, take a picture of it so you understand what this looks like and you can compare it to future beds in the future. The same thing goes with tracks. You're gonna look at the local sign too of rubs. You're gonna look at both were they year after year? Has this buck been using us year after year? Can I get a feel for how old this buck is based on the sign he's making? Uh, what's the depth and unique features of this rub? We'll touch on that later with the buck I killed in Wisconsin this year, but he had really wide brow tines. So he was scraping really flat and smooth on a lot of the rubs he made. There's plenty of deer that have kickers on their brow tines and things like that. Really easy to see that. Well, every time I see a rub by this deer, it's gouged on the right side, not the left. It's probably a buck with a kicker on his right side or no brow tine on the left and a brow tine on the right. So you get a feel by looking at this sign over time and comparing it to the deer you're seeing on it. You can actually tell what buck is making that sign when you, and you can use that during the season. Um, you really want to look at the height of the rubs. We've all heard about you know, the fork rubbing a telephone pole. Definitely happens. I, I like to judge a little bit by the width of the tree. But it's really important to see the average height of that rub. Where is that deer most comfortable applying its pressure? Because when you go to push on a door, you don't push on a door from up here. You push on a door from your center of mass. That center of mass is going to be where the center of the rub is. And you can get a feel for how tall that deer is. Make sure you have in mind what ground is he standing on because he might be standing in water and you're scouting in the spring and it's ice and you're like, man, this is low, but he's really standing in a foot of water when he's making that rub. So that's really important to understand too. When it comes to tracks, I look at the gate distance. So how far between steps is this deer going? That gives me a feel for how long, how big the deer is. I look at the depth of the track. I compare it to little does and other stuff that I'm certain are small deer. I look at how deep they're sinking in similar terrain and then I can get a feel for how deep that buck is then sinking into. I look at the size of the track, of course. Everyone's heard of the four-finger track. Again, don't be afraid to take a tape measure, take a picture of that, pick out a specific characteristic with that track. Maybe it's abnormally long, wide, narrow, things like that. And then you can start to relate a track to what that deer is. So you can scout your way in, see that track, look at your catalog, understand that you know that deer, and now you're hunting that deer like you got a trail camera picture of him, but you're only looking at his track. Um, after that, I look at the travel route. Bucks often travel, especially mature ones, in a really tortuous route. They wind back and forth. They're gaining information by crossing doe trails. They're in the rut making point to point to point decisions regardless of terrain sometimes. Bucks travel in a really, really different way. So the more you understand that you're following a buck trail, the more that you'll get used to, all right, I see how this deer's traveling. I'm scouting my way and I see how this deer's traveling. I understand that this is a buck and not just a big doe or a young buck or something like that. Um, I look at the intelligence of the bed too as well. So how easy it, is it for someone to get in there and kill them? Chances are around here and most of the areas the people around here are hunting, if it's really easy to get in and kill him, he's probably dead already. So th that's my number one determination on if a deer is mature in this bed or not. Further than that, what is he monitoring? Is he looking at the pressure? Is he looking at where pressure is coming from? Is he monitoring does? It'll give me a feel for the time of year. Really important thing to consider when looking at buck beds. And what are his exit options? Oftentimes, they'll exit through really thick cover if they're a mature buck. They won't just run through an open prairie or an open farm field or something like that. That's why you usually don't get a good look at a big buck when it runs off from you in the woods. It's very rare to bump a big buck and then see him immediately clear as day. They purposefully choose their exit routes to make sure that they are monitoring where they came from, but also getting away from danger because they understand people will shoot them if they run out in the open. Um, after that, I look at trail cameras. Uh, we talked about relating a picture to track. And I kind of want to just emphasize that nighttime pictures are not always meaning that that buck is not bedding anywhere near that area. This buck, I got almost exclusively outside of shooting hours, and I was within 
I think I was within 20 yards of him four times in daylight, hunting him in a very, very similar area. Um, and he just wouldn't clear cattails in daylight and ended up not killing this deer. But I was so afraid of only getting nighttime pictures of him that I didn't go after him right away. And I definitely should have. I would have killed him a lot sooner. Those are all things that you can determine what class of buck is using that bed. Piece number three is when is he bedded there? Again, you can look at sign. You can look at if what's the age of the sign. Has it been super weathered down? We'll get to an example later of what more weathered down sign looks like versus really young sign. What you can do is you can kind of take a picture of that tree again. You know, if you want, take your stick, rub up a tree, see what that looks like fresh on a maple, see what that looks like fresh on a cedar. And every time I like doing this on my access as well, I like doing that on my access and I take a picture of it week after week. So I know exactly how old that tree is going to look week after week during the season. And so you can go look at a tree in a bed in spring scouting and understand like this is a super old rub, there's mildew in it, or this is a really fresh rub, this is probably late rut, late season kind of area. So quantify the time by looking at the age and also look at the aggression. Is this going to be a lot of different rubs deeply buried in? Is he making a display here with these rubs or is he just marking his territory getting a scent down because he's sitting in that bed all the time um after that i look at it if it's a stain bed and the proximity to doe bedding so proximity to doe bedding is obviously going to make me think it's a little more rut i'll talk a little bit i'll show you a video example of what i mean by a stain bed but basically it's stained estrus pea in the bed which you can see pretty clearly in a lot of marsh situations varying or uniform rubs on the perimeter so are you seeing rubs that are very tall, very short? Are you seeing a huge mix? Are you seeing the same buck making the same rub all around this perimeter? Oftentimes when it's a really thick area, we've all seen like the poplar groves where there's tall rubs, short rubs, thick trees, thin trees. It's often a lot of different really young, really aggressive bucks making those rubs. So it, what we talked about before with pictures will help you learn to age rubs. Food sources nearby, is it oaks? Is it soybeans? Is it something coming out of phase really early in the season? Is it something coming into phase in the late season, like corn? What kind of food do you expect him to go to based on those trails we identified earlier? That will give you a feel for when the buck is using the bed as well. And then you look at the, the foliage and the surrounding cover. Is it sound-based? Is he in cattails where he's not going to see anything and there's barely any wind currents or thermals going on? Um, is it visual-based? Is it he's up on a hill and he's typically doing this in the late season, all the leaves are probably off, it doesn't have much of a wind advantage from the primary wind. I'm assuming that that buck is going to be visual bedding. Is it scent-based? Is he relying on a thermal to come up to him? Is he relying on a dropping thermal? Is he relying on the common wind direction? That'll give you a feel for when is he bedding there because that will tell you what the foliage needs to look like when he is bedding there. So after that, how does the buck enter and exit the bed? This is a very, very important piece because you can be within 20 yards of a buck just on the wrong trail and you'll never see him. Uh, so what's important for me in evening hunts is he using multiple exits or one exit. In this scenario, you can actually see on this screen here, this is actually a bed. Uh, this is from an aerial image, and you can see trail here, trail here, trail here, and then a trail there. So this buck has a lot of different options for exiting. For me, why is he going in this direction? Is it does? Is he going for early season food one direction? There's a reason he's exiting in each of those directions. So it's really important for me to figure out and for you to think of when you're going and finding these spots and which one you need to target them on. Can you see the exit on a map? Like in this scenario and the ones we looked at before, a lot of times in marshes you can. Hills, you often can't. Um, is he going bed to food? Is he going after that early season food source that you identified? Is he going bed to does? Is he trying to use thermals to locate those does? Is he trying to cruise below for does bedded up on hills and catch those thermals? Is he more betting to just go straight line to those does? It'll give you a little bit of more of a feel for which direction he's actually traveling. And then also you can use trail camera footage and stuff like that to find out where he previously exited that bed and execute on that on your hunt. In mornings, um, where was he at at night is big for me because he might travel a mile during night. Well, I'm pretty sure he's going to be coming from that direction you know, when I go to hunt him in the morning. So that's really important. You can gain that from sightings, shining, trail cameras, things like that. Um, the exit direction when he's using that bed might be the exact same as his entry. So consider that if there's only one trail and you know where he's exiting, maybe sit that trail for his entry. It just depends on what they're using the bed for, if it's sound or wind. Um, and then the wind direction, a lot of times there's a lot of bucks that come in where the wind, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect them to come from this wind. The bed's here, the wind's blowing this direction, and they come in from here. It doesn't really make a lot of sense until you consider that Deer think of everything scent-based. So that deer's walking in here and sitting here with the wind coming in this direction, can't smell that bed beforehand, but he's tracking anything that went in there. And he's also 
defending his track. So he's understanding he can smell from a long way away how predators usually come up on deer is by tracking them. So he's tracking, he's smelling anything that's coming to track him. That's why deer may bed going the opposite direction you expect rather than them jay hooking in, which is our other example where they're trying to smell the bed beforehand. So where do I need to be set up to kill them? This is extremely important because you got to know how much you need to push the envelope. You got to know if you should be sitting back. And oftentimes in marsh country, like we're all used to, you're limited to pretty much one tree. But um, my specific buck goal is to get as close as possible to the bed or bedding area, typically just the bed, uh, without alerting any deer. So I'm trying not to alert any satellite deer. I'm trying not to alert just more than just him. Uh, often we worry about the one buck and the one bed we found, but we don't do any scouting to figure out what other deer are going to be in this area. Is he going to be bedded with a doe? We don't do the work to find that out. We end up pushing it too close. Another deer bumps him and it's over. Um, for just any buck, if I'm hunting a size class specifically out of state or if I don't have a specific target picked out, I just want to get as close as possible to the highest odds travel point or scenario without alerting any deer. So that may be a scrape during the rut, maybe a major food source. But if I'm not picking out a specific deer, I'm more targeting him in the most likely area that he's going to be in daylight. And it might not be right next to his bed. Things to consider, too, of course, are the wind direction. What's the wind the deer wants versus the wind that you want? You want to give the wind a little bit in the deer's favor, but you also want to make sure that you're not getting winded, of course. So that just off wind that a lot of guys talk about is really crucial. Um, do you need a wind switch? Do you need this deer to shift beds in order for you to be hunting him? A lot of times we'll see on like a little knob where a deer will be monitoring all sorts of areas. He'll need a specific wind coming over his back to understand any of the terrain behind him. If we get a wind switch, it's probably going to shift. Then I will be targeting him where he shifts to rather than the original bed. So I need to understand in that scenario, do I need to be set up to catch him on the shift or am I catching him in his original bed? Um, what is the height of his back cover? Is he in things like red osier dogwood or willows, stuff that drops around the mid to late October? Why would I, I wouldn't be targeting him in November because he's likely not bedding in the wide open sun in times like that. Or is he bedding in really low thick cover and wants sun exposure in a south facing slope in the late season? So it's really important to understand the height of back cover it also gives you a bit of timing. Um, the height of the back cover as well for yourself as someone that's in the tree, you need to be set up so that you are covered and not just as high as you can or a one stick or whatever. Often we've looked at maple trees and the cover will be a couple sticks high and your best shooting lane will be above that first row, below that second one, and you can shoot out and you still have cover. So I want as much as possible to blend in with my background and I also want to have the shooting opportunities I need in order to kill that deer. Um, can you place a barrier downwind? I like doing this. Uh, I do it with deadfall. Uh, a lot of the times I want to pick a tree where there's a bunch of down trees to my side. If there's a wind that I'm worried about, I would love to have a lot of deadfall and a lot of obstacles for that deer to get through to go in that scenario, especially during the rut, because it doesn't do them a whole lot of benefit to walk through that deadfall unless there's doge bedded in there. Um, it would be great for me to have a cliff, a steep ravine, somewhere a deer is just slightly less likely to travel on my downwind side if I have to hunt in on a risky wind. Um, what will the foliage look like when the deer is there? We already talked about, of course, that's extremely critical. Um, and then where are you going to be shooting them? Are you shooting them on a specific trail? Are you shooting them at the scrape? Are you shooting them at a secondary food source that he's hitting before his main food source? It's really important that you understand where you need to shoot to and that you set up accordingly and pick your tree accordingly. So how must I access this setup? Um, you, you need to understand that there's a certain amount of pressure that a deer will be willing to accept, and usually that happens on a common access trail. So can I access this using a common access trail? Can I bump around to it to do something different than the other hunters? Is he monitoring that access trail? It's really important to understand that. Um, you have to get a feel when you're sitting in that bed for what is the deer smelling. Is he smelling that access trail? Then I absolutely can't walk down on it. So I need to plan my access accordingly to maybe go from a kayak or something like that. Um, I want to look at satellite bedding. I want to look at particularly where the does in that area are going to be bedded or the younger bucks are going to be bedded. And he's using them as a point of defense so that he chooses to get up after those deer are. Um, after that, I want to look at the noise of entry. I don't want to be walking through extremely loud grass if I'm walking right up to him. That's pretty simple. And then where to check for sign on entry. For me, it's really important for me to cross the trail that I believe he used to get into that bed, especially in the marshes, to identify if he's creating fresh, fresh water splatter onto the cattails or stuff like that. I want to know, before I go into the hunt, is he actually using that bed? 
So identifying those areas in my spring scouting beforehand, where do I need to check for sign to know if this bed is active or not? I also need to know when he will start moving. That'll help me determine how far he will get, where I need to make my setup, uh, what trail will you continue to go down uh, and dodging his line of travel. So I don't want to be set up in an area where my access, whether I see the deer or not, is going to cause damage on him. So if he's using that bed and he comes out too late, I don't want to be set up in an area that he's going to hit 100 yards later necessarily if I can avoid it. I would like to be in an area where I never cross the trail that I know he's going to end up going down if I just doesn't happen to work out on that hunt. Um, in the morning, when must I be set up? Sometimes that's super early, sometimes it's later. It's more sightings and pictures oriented than anything else. Piece number seven is how does pressure influence this deer? So my goal is to fully understand how the pressure influences the deer in the area. And that often happens through process of elimination. It's going to be, am, I can make an assumption that my area is super high pressure because everyone tells me this area of the state's high pressure, but I need to go figure out, okay, what damage are they actually doing on this marsh? What damage are they actually doing on this deer? Um, does he get pushed back further as the season goes on? And now I understand that he's using the bed later in the season because this is after he's gotten pushed back. It's very important to understand what the pressure does in the area, what the human tendencies are to target a specific buck. Um, how tolerant is he of in pressure? There's one buck that I'll be after this year that's a absolute giant and people disturb him all the time and he keeps to the same area, but he waffles between the private and public and that's why people haven't killed him yet. So he's very strategic, but he's also habitual despite being pressured. You need to kind of understand what is this deer willing to tolerate? And you'll find that out as you inevitably screw up hunts along the way. Um, would he have to relocate far away and leave the property if I pressure him. Obviously, you're going to make a very, very strategic strike that's based on timing and information in that case. But if he's not going to bump away and you're in the heart of a giant piece of public land, you might be able to be a little more aggressive and push him and control him into an area that you want to be. Uh, where is the surrounding hunter sign? Obviously, you're going to look at trails, or trail cam stands, prep trees, cut trails, tree tags, flagging tape, sometimes even coming out from your scout routes in the night so you can have a light on and find all those tree tags. I know it's really popular in Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, you're able to identify a whole lot of different pressure and how that's going to influence the deer. And then when will other hunters be using the surrounding area? You can kind of gauge this on how clear the, the tree is that they cut up. Usually it's awfully clear for bow hunting. You see a lot more branches left on for gun hunting. Um, you can kind of get a feel for whether this person's going to be using it in the rut based on a lot of different little factors like that. And the last piece is how and why might this buck shift? So there's lots of different shifts. So there's pressure, and it's important to consider that you are causing pressure, whether you're spring scouting, summer scouting, or whatever, and hunting, and also other people are. So a lot of people we consider pressure as, what's the other people doing? And you often have to understand, what am I doing to pressure this deer, and how is that deer going to move because of that pressure? Is he going to shift because of does going in and out of heat? Is he going to shift to go follow those does? Is he going to shift because the food source that he was commonly targeting has now gone out of phase, like the oaks have fully dropped and gotten rotted? Um, the things that are really important to look for is other hunter sign, the spring shift we already talked about. When you get in an area, there's a lot of spring scouters. You get to actually see how that shift plays out when you go back and scout in the summer. Um, you get to move on to the next similar food source. You're looking for areas that maybe this went out of phase, but this oak ridge over here is still in, or you're looking on to the next food source, like maybe he's on natural browsing natives now. And so you're moving to adjust to that shift, and you want to preemptively be there before he's actually making that shift. So he's not sensing your pressure, but the first time you have an opportunity, you're executing on it. Similar bedding situations, of course, if he's in isolated cover like we saw on the map, we're going to pick another willow bush that's in a very similar situation if we bumped him off the last one you can actually use that it's kind of like a bump and dump but it's more like concentrating where you're bumping him and maybe you're not going to the next bed or the same bed but you're actually you know if i have one area that i'm really good at hunting and he might be in four i'm going to bump him off those other three if i have to and go to those hunts and then make that last hunt in my highest odds most confident area and i'll whether he was there or not ensure that he won't be going back to those harder to set up spots after that you're looking at doe bedding areas and cover, cover going out of phase, does shifting, all those things like that will garner how, will kind of control how a deer shifts as well. Um, also, you're looking for the sign of an exit direction. The sign of the exit direction is going to tell you why he's there and tell you why he's going to shift. So if he's exiting out to Oaks, you can tell that he's probably going to shift to go to the next food source. He's probably there in the early season because of the oaks. If he's exiting out to doe bedding, he's probably gonna shift to the next doe bedding area where the next doe is in heat. 
Um, so that's like a little brief rundown of the eight steps. Uh, and I'm going to give you guys a bit of an example video here that is actually my Wisconsin buck this year. And you'll see that it's really important to understand that we're often wrong in these situations, just like Andy talked about. We're often wrong. And I want to show you how I adapted over time using these strategies and found that I was wrong and still adjusted to the situation and made it work. Let's see if we can get audio here. <laughs> Call up my partner. So this is in-season scouting right now for me. So on this map that we looked at earlier, it actually lines up extremely similar to what we were looking at where I actually killed my deer. There's the edges of tamaracks here. There's an oak island here. There's an oak island here. This is my access. All those are pretty much spot on to what occurred when I killed my deer this year. So originally I started here, found this sign with large tracks, and saw a route going off in a tamarack, and I did not consider that he was going to be in this monotonous terrain that just was impossible to set up, and I just, I didn't think a deer was going to do that, but I kept my mind open knowing that I just saw a mature buck in the spring walk back in this direction, so I wanted to go follow that and figure out what was going on. All right, guys, let's move on. And I found this bed. This is directly in his bed. He's actually been bedding in it recently. There's hair everywhere, poop everywhere, everything you can think of. I'll show you afterwards. That was probably from last season. But he must have some pretty crazy bucks. He's not even really big enough right here. So in that in that video, I don't know if you guys can all hear it. I know the TV is rather quiet. But I talk about finding the bed. I talk about hair being from all points in the season. And I originally thought that this buck was bedding in there day after day after day, all season long. And I saw this rub, and I saw that there's not much dug in there. The, the center of the rub is fairly clean, and it looked like he had really wide brow tines. I actually ended up killing the buck that made this rub, and he had very wide brow tines. So that's how you kind of use rubs to figure out what specific deer. So what pieces of the puzzle have we found so far? And there's lots of different... Of course, there's eight different pieces here, but for me in this scouting trip, what I found is where is he bedded already? It's right where I'm standing. It's on a tamarack root ball. What is the size of the buck that's there? I already know it's big. It's a really wide tree. It's a high rub, and the buck likely has pretty wide brow tines from the kind of rub that he made. When is the buck using that bed? I have no idea at this point. I think he's using it all year long, uh, but I'll go further into that. Where is the buck traveling after using this bed? He's going down the same trail with the sign leading to the bed. So this is kind of where this is kind of where I tracked from the main area down here, um, followed the sign into his bed. So that's this trail that I assume he's going. And then where do I need to go? Where do I need to be set up to kill him? No idea at this point. Uh, how must I access it? I know that I already can't access from the tamaracks, and I can't cross that doe trail that parax parallels them. Um, I have the potential to bump her. I have the potential to bump him. Um, I knew this was a doe trail because it's marked by different height rubs all throughout it. And how does pressure influence this deer and how might this buck shift? I have no idea at this point. So right now I don't really have, I have enough information to throw a hunt at it, but I don't have all the pieces that I would like to have. So I said that I thought that the rub was from early season because there's mildew in that rub. And honestly, I was off in this scenario. Um, I predicted that this rub was made in the early season based on the other pines that I had seen in southwestern Wisconsin hill country that were really in dry climate. They don't rot out nearly as quick. They don't gain mildew nearly as quick as they do in wet climates. So I actually found that this rub had aged rather quickly comparatively, and this rub was actually made later in the season. I thought that he was making this in early season because there wasn't a lot of aggression around 
the real reason there wasn't a whole lot of rubs in the surrounding area is because he didn't have to defend his area that he's been betting in for many years from other bucks. He was a very dominant deer. This is crazy. He's just sitting here all the time. This is like what you hope and pray that you find when you go scouting. Let me give you guys a closer look at this. Look at this hair, recent hair. There's poop everywhere. Bunch of hair here, hair here, bunch of hair, bunch of hair, poop. There's blood. So it's hard, probably hard for you guys to see in the audience, but this is outlining a little. Yeah, this TV is really pixelated. This is this is videos on my YouTube channel, but this is outlining a very stained area of grass. And I originally didn't really pick up on this, but seeing hair of a lot of varying lengths, and I'm assuming it's because the buck's using it all season long. I'll get to a little bit more, but it's actually that the doe was betting there before him, and she was leaving early season hair, mid season, and late season hair, despite whether he was using it or not. He just moved into the area to get after the doe. In hindsight, I'm noticing that this area was extremely stained with doe pee. And I'll kind of show you where that comes into play here. Like this is stained with doe, yellow grass. The way I've kind of developed this theory is back when I hunted hill country out in southwest of Wisconsin, I had a young doe when she was out by me. And when she was leasing, she was just calling like crazy. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but. down to that ridge and I went over there and smelt that really stinky estrus pee and she was staying and every time I've come across estrus pee it just looks super stinky there's plenty of times that I've watched many many bucks come out and pee and I've gone by and there's been nothing even with tarsal glands it doesn't often stain as much but estrus pee it's reeky it lasts for weeks and it stains it for many, many months to come. And I found a lot of the times in spring when I'm finding beds that actually have this stain in them that they are in fact used during the rut. So it helps me a lot with the timing. Now seeing this stain bed, I start to understand what time of year that this is being used. And that only does happen by observing a doe going out there, bleeding, being in heat, peeing, and then going and confirming what I originally thought. So that's what we originally thought and now I know that he's bedded in a tamarack root ball with or near a doe in heat. I know that he's using it when the doe's in heat because the doe is now bedding there and marking that she's in heat. And then he's making the rub at a similar time of year. What size of the buck's bedding there? We've already covered that. We're still on that same page. Uh, when is the buck using the bed? Now we know he's definitely using the bed when the doe that is using it is in heat. We know that she's bedding there all year round. So he's waiting for that time period to go and hit that bed. That's when I need to target him. When is he traveling to the bed? Where, where, where is he traveling after using the bed? He's traveling down the trail with all the sign leading to the bed, the one I originally followed to the bed. He's traveling back down that trail, following the doe most likely. He's probably locked down with that doe at this point because he's in a very isolated spot that no one else is getting to him. Um, where do I need to be set up? I'm still not sure about that. Um, where must I access the setup to kill him? I already know I can't access from the doe trail. Can't bump her. It's even more important now. Not sure how pressure is going to influence this deer, but how might the buck shift? Um, how and why might the buck shift? The buck's probably going to shift if that doe gets pushed out, and he's probably going to shift if that doe comes out of heat. So I know I've got a limited time window to hit him, and I also can't disturb that doe. Real windy days. This is the first hunt. This is the first hunt where I go into that spot. So you can see here, I come into the stand that I'd scouted, the bed down here. The bed down here is where I had just shown you where I was sitting in that tamarack group ball where the giant rub was. I, ex I decided to set a trail camera what I thought was his exit direction. Um, and I went into this spot and set up, and I had found fresh bladder on the cattail. So I knew he was in there. I go into the trail that he uses going in there, and I find that it's wet, haven't had rain in weeks. I know that he's in there using that bed, or at least a deer. So I get up into my tree here, and while you can't really hear it on this audio here, I can hear something back into that wall of tamaracks moving like crazy. 
but it never, ever comes out onto the trail that I thought they were going to exit on. So that's kind of the deer travel is how this deer torturously moved around back in there. One sec. So this is what we know now. So where is he bedded? Now I know he's somewhere on a tamarack root ball. He's somewhere near this doe and heat, but I don't know which one now because I've heard him. I've hunted this spot, but I know he's back in there. I heard him stand up. I heard him walk around, but I don't know specifically which one he's on, and that may have been my fault for bumping him. Um, I know it's the same buck. I've already gotten a trail camera picture at this point. I've confirmed that he's a 10-point with wide brow tines. Um, when he's using it, we still know. Where is he traveling after using the bed? I know he's traveling down a trail with sign following the doe, but I don't know specifically which one because the first one I was not really correct with. Um, where did I need to be set up to kill him? I already know I need to be tight to that bedded doe. I know that I was already within 80 yards of her, but that wasn't close enough. So I need to be very, very close to her, and I need to be within that tamarack line because he's actually traveling throughout there during the afternoon and not breaking that line of tamaracks even into cattails in daylight. Um, how must I access the setup? I know I can't access within the tamaracks, and I know I can't access any way that I'm going to bump that doe, but I have to get really tight. Uh, I have the high potential to, to bump satellite deer, and I need to scout my way in because that is what allowed me to go find that he was in this area this time, but it's also going to be what is going to help me find where that doe decided to go, and that's going to be the key to finding the buck in this case. Um, how does pressure influence this deer? It caused him to recede into the tamaracks even further and switch his beds up. So I know that there's going to be a lot of damage being done if I bump him a second time in this core area. How might this buck shift? Uh, if the doe gets pushed out and I pressure him too much, he's going to move deeper into the tamaracks when he's shifted. And even worse, if he decides that that whole section of tamaracks is bad, he's going to make a huge shift to a completely different section of the property. And this might be my last crack at him. So this is my second hunt into this area. This red line is my access route. And on my way in, I scout in, and I found a night bed from a doe. And same stained grass, absolutely reeks of estrus, and I can follow it going back into those tamaracks. And this is from the video I put out on my channel, The Wild Calling, about this, which may be posted on the Mobile Hunter pretty soon here, too. So now I looked at my previous scenario. This is what we thought before. I looked at my previous scenario and I saw, all right, this is how that doe bedded. I can follow that doe trail back and I'm like, all right, we've got a section of root balls coming up right here. I'm already within that tamarack line. I'm already where they're going to travel in daylight. I know that she's a bit further. Now I know I can stop. I know I know I have to stop. I know that if I go any further, I'm going to be bumping into that pressure, to, that core area of them, and I'm going to likely be pushing that deer out and screwing up my last opportunity. And I know that because I took all the information I used from the last setup, from previous hunts, and now I'm applying it to the situation. So now we're on the day of the kill. We're on the sit of the kill. What do we actually know now? Well, I found out this information on the way scouting in, and I now know that he's bedded on that tamarack root ball with a doe in heat. I know that it's the same big 10 I'm after. I know that because that doe used that same trail where I found her nighttime bed was coming from the previous area that I had marked her in heat. So I know it's that same doe. Uh, when is the doe in, or when is the buck using his bed? And the doe in heat that's been bedding there all year is finally in heat, which is now today, November 10th, 2023. Where is he traveling after using that bed? He's certainly traveling with the doe. Um, he's following that route with sign, and he's making sure that he's on that doe on the way out because he's absolutely locked down with her. He's echoing her footsteps, and that's why we heard so much movement deeper back in the tamarack set sit before. Where do I need to be set up to kill him? Where I'm set up right now, it's 50 yards downwind of the bed of doe. It's the only tree on her exit route. I know that she's further back in there because I've tracked her to the spot, and there's no other place for her to go way further back in those tamaracks because essentially it's a giant wall. There's, there's no exit to another direction. She's got to come out to me. Um, how must I access the setup? It was very important that I scouted my way in. I used the doe entry trail because her entry trail was the exact same as her exit trail in this situation. Um, I need to stop before the thicker tamaracks to avoid bumping them. So I get inside that edge and I stop right there. I know when it gets thicker, that's likely where I'm going to be in the territory of bumping these deer. And then how does the pressure cause this deer to be bumped? How does it influence it? Um, causes the deer to recede back in the tamaracks and switch beds. I know that if I do that again, it's probably going to be over for me. And that doe is definitely going to shift 
and that buck is probably going to go wherever the doe goes in this case. Um, how and why might he shift? Obviously, when that buck, when that doe that's been in heat for a few days now is likely out of heat, he's probably not going to be on that doe anymore. He's probably going to go seek for another one. So I know that he's going to relocate either because I've disturbed him or that doe has moved on. So now we understand the eight steps. And we've made guesses before. We've set, made setups where I thought I knew the eight steps, and I failed several times. I failed not knowing what time of year he was bedded there. I failed not knowing what trail he was going to come down, not knowing what specific bed. But I kept going in there, and I kept, we like to say, and one of my greatest coaches I've ever had in wrestling has always said the saying, win or lose, learn and improve. So I was losing over and over again, but I knew that I needed to get back in there, figure out these eight steps, and then put them together and solve the puzzle of this big buck. And now we're at the final guess. We're at the situation where I know exactly what this buck is doing. And a lot of the times you only find out those steps on the day you kill. So this is the doe right here. She's just barely clearing brush. They're moving back from this gold bed right back there up towards my stand, and they made it probably 50 yards in daylight. And I could actually hear these deer, and you'll hear this in the video if you go and watch it. I can hear the deer stand up and start drinking water. And I'd never heard a deer drink water before. And I remember thinking, oh, it's really interesting. They don't drink like a dog. They slurp it up. Like they, they suck it like a human does. And I was like, wait, that means the deer is extremely close. Like I need to get ready. So this doe immediately locked onto me. And I knew I needed to draw extremely early to avoid her catching my draw. And this is an incredibly fast speed, but I've never held a draw on a deer for as long as I did. And you can see she's absolutely taken her time before even breaking a shallow clearing. He's still looking for that doe, and now he's dead. So that was essentially a story of the, the eight steps to run down of the different processes and the different pieces that I want to figure out to solve a mature buck's puzzle when I'm often targeting a single buck. You can use this scenario. You can use these different tools in many different places, but it would give you a lot of direction for improving your game and hunting. Thank you guys very much for watching. I appreciate it. Um, We got uh, any questions too? Um, I know Rick is going to be going around in the audience here with a microphone, and uh, if you guys have any questions for me at all, I'd love to answer them. Or afterward, if you don't want to come in front of a crowd, I'd love to talk to you in person as well. There's a, a green X back here, a camo X. If you'd like to ask any questions, just come back there. It helps with the interference of the microphone. Hold it close to your chin. Just curious, uh, what bow were you shooting and what kind of let off was it at? I was shooting an RX4 and it was a, it was a Hoyt RX4. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the let off percentage was, but I'm sure it's somewhere around 85 to 90. But when I, with that shot, normally, obviously, I don't plan on ever taking a shot like that. But uh, often when I, and my fiance can attest to this, I'll often go on very, very long runs, like five mile runs. And I'll immediately pick up my bow and shoot, and I'll shoot at the farthest distance I can. I'll also practice holding draw. I don't hold draw for like a certain period of time. I just hold draw until I feel like my arms are about to give out, and then I focus on executing a clean shot from there. And so for me, it's really about I have a lot of freedom understanding that I can hold draw for two minutes and knowing that I'm not going to bump any deer coming out when I draw here. So oftentimes I draw before I even see the buck. I know it's the buck coming from that bed 90 95 percent of the time if one deer is coming from that area it's going to be that buck um so i will draw beforehand and i'll let that buck come to me and i have as little movement as possible i'll just hold that draw down by my chest and make sure that i'm not you know if i'm holding up here there's a lot less stabilization there but i hold it deep down by my chest and then i'll focus my pin and actually in the video if you guys watch it, it might show it but in my gopro footage i actually glance off of the pin again and I always do that to make sure I understand exactly what angle that deer is standing at, which is why I was able to put it right behind that back shoulder blade and cross the entire length and exit out his back rib. Hey, Jacob. Uh, so a couple questions here. Um, real quick, 
there's some very aggressive moves in what you did there. I mean, you're in the Bucks bed, like physically there. And I think one thing that a lot of people are scared of is being too aggressive, especially with a mature deer, whether it's cutting a trail or jumping into a bed. So quickly address that. And then the second question, fellow engineer here, very analytical minded person, just as you are, there's a lot of information for a person to digest there in your case or anybody else's case. How do you personally deal with that information? Are you rattling around that in your head or have you developed like spreadsheets, a notepad? How are you doing it to get from an empty set of eight steps to a complete seven or hopefully eight steps to get there? What's your thought process? How do you keep that information straight? Gotcha. Well, I love both those questions. Um, so for me, uh, especially you, a lot of you probably listen to Annie Mae, um, being aggressive is great to me. When I fail and I bump a deer, specifically when I bump a deer, I can go in that bed and understand exactly what the deer was doing. There's no, why was I wrong? Why didn't this deer come out? Was he even using that bed? Was my timing off? There's no guessing. There's knowing exactly what that deer, which deer was there, exactly what he was doing. I love... <laughs> People have heard me talk about my strategy out of state. Sometimes I'll have what I call a sacrificial lamb deer. And what I'll do is I'll move around an area that I don't understand. And I'll have a lot of preconceived notions of what people have told me or what I think they're doing betting. And if I'm just not figuring out, I will go and strategically try to bump those deer, you know, from, from downwind. I don't want them to smell me. But I will bump those deer and sit in that bed and figure out, okay, what are they monitoring? How much of those eight steps can I gather? The other thing, too, is glassing. You pretty much always figure out those eight steps immediately. If you can watch how a deer behaves and where he lays down and gets up from, there's all eight. Like, you know the timing. You just saw him do it. So for me, observation is excellent. It's also extremely hard to get in the marsh with cattails that are 10 feet tall. So it's a luxury that I love to use when I can. And to me, being aggressive and failing is just another step to learning. Like Andy said, it's a prerequisite to succeeding. Failing is absolutely necessary if you're going to succeed. And sure, you can you can get lucky and you can trust in strategies and trust that your situation is the exact same as someone you heard before. But until you go there and you fail yourself, you won't develop confidence in your own skill. You won't develop that instinct because you'll be trying another person's theory rather than actually developing the skill you have within yourself. Um, and that that really does only happen through failure. And then as far as your question with how do I record this data and spreadsheets and stuff like that, Yes, I use spreadsheets, um, kind of nerdy. Um, I use a lot of spreadsheets in Excel for trail cameras and stuff. I, I haven't done this in a bit too, and that's more because of lack of time, but it was extremely valuable when I was in hill country, figuring out the direction of travel, the wind speed, all of the barometric pressure, the humidity, everything like that. I would go crazy with determining was there a cold front beforehand, cold front after, wind switch, time of day, all these things, and I would, it helped me really develop patterns for specific deer and it helped me also understand how sporadic specific deer can be. They're not always wind-based. And, and it helped me realize that I need to throw some of those preconceived notions I have out the window more and more um, in order to develop my own skill and understanding of the specific situation I'm in, which only I can really speak to and understand because I'm the only one in it. Um, but again, taking information from other people and trying it out is where you get a very, very good starting point. Other than that, uh, with the 12 I was chasing this year, that was actually my target buck that I got incredibly close to many, many times. I Actually, the final time I hunted him was right before I left for, um, right before I left for Ohio, and he got killed by someone the day I killed in Ohio. Let me get you to the slide here. That's that buck. Um, so that buck, the last time I bumped him, was five minutes after shooting time at the base of my tree and he was five yards away. I could literally hear him sniffing and smelling me, and then he blew for two minutes, and I have a bunch of audio of it, and I cried. And um, and so um, that book, I was just wrapping around in my head over and over again. I had these debates with Jake Bush. We would call for like two hours, and Caitlin probably hated it, um, but um, we would call for like two hours, and we would look at camera pictures, and we would relate these camera pictures to other things, and and just try to theorize about what this deer is doing. And it really came down to what is the work I did spring scouting that has allowed me to have the waypoints I have, all the, the points I have, all the notes I have in these waypoints, and how am I going to relate the current until I'm getting to what I think this buck is doing and relate to the trails he's going down or the bed he's using or why I'm only seeing him at night. And for me, I do keep a note section on my phone, or if I really, really, really want to keep it organized, I'll do a spreadsheet. 
but I keep a note section on my phone of outlining those eight steps and trying to answer them. And I won't just erase them if I was wrong. I'll keep it in there, but I'll start a new list. And that allows me to refine why I was wrong and understand, more importantly, not just I was wrong, but why and how can I improve in the future. Um, yeah, a lot of history with this book. Really interesting point with this deer is he was coming, he was in really isolated island bedding, but every single time I got a trail camera picture of him, he had no mud or no water in his legs, and almost every other deer did. So that is what tipped me off, that I was only getting nighttime pictures of this deer. There's no possible way he could have gotten to this area without crossing water if he wasn't living there. So that gave me the confidence to go chase him. And without daytime pictures, only one time did I get a daytime picture of him. Um, w without those daytime pictures, I was able to get within range of this deer four separate times. And the only reason I didn't kill him is because there were cattails about as tall as this pole uh, covering him up. So there are times that I literally saw him pushing does at 10 yards, and I, I couldn't shoot him. Um, but what an amazing deer that was to chase and learn from. And I absolutely would not have killed the deer I did in Wisconsin this year without chasing him. Anything else? Anyone else have any other questions? No? Well, thank Jake. you guys so much. I really appreciate you listening, the interaction questions. I look forward to talking to you guys all day today here.